Well, good morning, everybody. Good morning, people. Hi, uh, it's good to see you all here. Um, thanks for coming, and let's all stand, and let's start with a word of prayer today, guys. <laughs> Heavenly Father, we are so happy that we get to come here, we get to worship you, Lord, and uh, that we get to just learn from your son, Jesus. Uh, we ask that in this service that you open us up, you open us up our minds and our hearts for the words that you have in store and the lessons that you want to teach us today, Father. We love you. We lift your name up. And we just ask that you bless the service. And we ask all these things in Jesus' name. study on Tuesday at the men's Bible study, um, they were talking about how God seals us as his own and that the evidence is the Holy Spirit living inside us. And, the, and it's a seal that seals forever. Amen. Praise God. That's so cool. Uh, you guys uh, go ahead and be seated. 
Grab your bulletins, if you would, this morning. There's a couple things I'd like to make mention of. First of all, if you were a guest with us, we want to say welcome. We are glad that you're here worshiping with us. If you would do us one favor, you'll see in your bulletin there, you'll find a connection card. If you wouldn't mind grabbing that and filling that out with as much information as you can give us, and, and, and you have two options. You can either A, drop it in the offering plate as it goes by later in the service, or if it's your first time with us, you can hang on to that. At the end of service, you can take it back here and trade it with one of our kitchen staff helpers. Uh, they want to send you home with a gift just for being our guest this morning. Um, if you look inside your bulletin, there's a couple things I'd like to make mention of. Um, first of all, I want to um, let you know that our, our youth are still going to camp. Um, there was a bit of a snafu on the camp's side. They overbooked our week of camp by 200 students. <laughs> And they asked us if we were willing to move to a different week, and we, we checked with our kids, and it turns out that half of our kids wouldn't have been able to go the second week, so we said, no, we're not moving. Um, they said, well, would you be willing to find lodging off-site? And, and they lowered the price from 300 per student to 100 per student so that we could afford the other, to, to basically to uh, rent a hotel <laughs> uh, so that we have lodging for the kids so that we could stay at camp. So we worked that out. But there's some extra, and all, so all of that is covered, but there were some extra expenses because now instead of someone delivering the kids to camp and then coming back and picking them up at the end of the week, we have to have someone who can drive the bus to go with them and stay with them to move them back and forth from the hotels. So there's extra cost in gas and extra cost in feeding said bus driver, which happens to be Pastor Albert. Uh, <laughs> and so uh, if, you would, if you would be willing, if you, uh, we've had other people, uh, Brandon said he's had people come up and say, does anybody still need help going to camp or that kind of thing? All of the original costs are covered, but there's some additional costs in that extra fuel and then extra meals and stuff for the bus driver. So if you, if, if you were one of those people that said, hey, I'd still like to contribute, if you'd like to make a little donation to the youth department to help cover those extra expenses, um, that would be greatly appreciated. Um, also coming up is we've got, um, on June 4th, we've got the American Heritage Girls and the Trail Life uh, USA, the, um, the, uh, the Boys and Girls um, Outdoor Adventure Ministry, um, is, is, is planning and putting together a fishing day up at Lions Pond. Now, it's a, it's a free fishing day, so if you, if you don't have a fishing license, you don't need it for that day, but if you would like, you, if you would like to accompany your child and go, and, and go fishing with them, um, there, are, there, are, there will be people that will be there to help you. They will have some extra equipment, I believe, Howard, so if you don't have a fishing pole or that kind of thing, don't let that stop you. We've got some extras and that kind of thing. So you, you come be a part and, and have some fun with your kids. I believe your kid has to be accompanied by an adult. Is that correct? correct? Okay. So How, Howard's like, don't just send 30 kids and expect me to bait every hook. And that kind of, he's, like, he's like, that's more than I want to sign up for. But if you would like to go with them and, and go and, and, and have that adventure, that you can find that information there at, in the center of your refrigerator reminder. I um, also want to draw attention to what's next, the making room update. Guys, we had our banquet in the new building last Sunday. Was that fun Ooh. if you were there? Um, I'm still trying to catch my breath a little bit, but um, <laughs> no, we had, we had over 150 people, I believe, around there um, come and join us for that banquet. And I want to let you know the, the leadership, so 18 families in our church, made a previous commitment. They made a, an advanced commitment. They committed over, they committed $168,000 to that uh, to that 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 make that making room building pledge and i believe the total of the pledges that were turned in that night uh, came in at 192,000 so that that was awesome now to let you know our goal for finishing the main floor and the and the mezzanine level our goal is 500,000 in pledges um, our, so that's our challenge goal our praise goal is 625,000 which will include all of that plus uh, furnishings and uh, par and the parking lot and then our hallelujah goal is $725,000 in, in pledges, and that'll cover all of that plus finish the basement as well. So we'll get all that as well. So, um, yeah, and Brandon's all excited about the basement. He's like, that's where the youth are going to go. All right, cool. Um, 
So how you can do that if, is um, if you received an invitation in the mail to the banquet, you're also going to receive a pledge card. If you have not already made your pledge, you're going to receive a pledge card in the mail um, where you can fill out what your pledge would be, and then you can either mail that back or you can turn that in uh, just by dropping it in the offering plate or that sort of thing. If you don't want to wait for that, if you would like to go ahead and make your pledge before then, you can go right out these doors, and on the table just outside these doors, there are some pledge cards right there. You can fill that information out um, and you can make that pledge so that so that we can so that we can see those goals be reached and so we can get that that building finished so we can use it all right next on the list we've got oh coffee shop talk um, in the months of July and August we're going to do a coffee shop talk series which is basically you guys submit the questions whatever questions you might have and me and the other pastors do our best to answer those questions from scripture now, last week, we hadn't had any questions turned in, so I threatened that we were going to walk verse by verse through Song of Solomon. Um, I did get four questions turned in because of that, so we're no longer going to do Song of Solomon, but that's only, that's only enough for four Sundays. I got eight Sundays to fill, so right now, we're going to answer some questions, and then we're going to spend the rest of our time in Lamentations. Just talking about all of the death and destruction that was going to come to the nation of Israel. If you don't want that, it's the ball is in your court. You got to submit some more questions, all right? If if you don't like what you get, it's your fault. I want you to know. I I claim I wash my hands of this. <laughs> <laughs> so submit those questions. You can do that by writing them on your, on, your, uh, on your connection card and turning them in in the offering plate, or you can go online or through the app and you can submit questions that way. There is no question that's off limits. There's no, there's no such thing as a stupid question. Well, there is such a thing as a stupid question, but not in this case. <laughs> you, can, you can ask whatever question you may want, and, and we're going to do some creative and some fun things as we answer those, those questions together, Okay. I think that was it. Wayne, am I, am I forgetting anything? Is that, that was the last one, right? All right. Stand with me, if you would, and cross the aisle and, and shake someone's hand and uh, make sure you know that, the, or they know you're glad they're here this morning. King of these people, you're the Lord of this nation. You are, you're the light in this darkness, you're the hope to the hopeless, you're the peace to the restless. You are, there is no like our God, there is 
Good morning. So we're finishing up this series called Making Room. Now, we, we started the series, we, we started by talking about making room in our hearts, right? If God is going to continue to call us to grow and to, and to reach more people, we have to make room in our hearts for those new relationships. Then we, then we continued by talking about making room in our schedules. I mean, we're, we're, we're overly busy people in, in today's society, aren't we? Uh, you know, I think about, you know, ye yesterday was my day off, and yet I had a graduation, a funeral, a graduation party, and a honey-do list, <laughs> right? And so, you know, but we, we all, we, we have to make room. We have to be intentional about our schedules to make room for the things of God. We also we talked about how we need to make room for our fi in our finances. We talked about biblical principles of dealing with money so that we can be ready, willing, and able to follow God's leading when it comes to where we invest and where we, where we put our money and that, and that kind of thing. Last week, Pastor Albert talked about making room in our home, making room uh, as our church, as our church home begins to, begins to grow and, and, and having the vision to see that through. This morning, I want to end this series by, making, by talking about how we need to make room in our faith. We need to make room in our faith. Does our faith need to grow? We need to understand that what God has for us tomorrow is nothing compared to what God has for us beyond that. 
And I need us to understand that in order for us to continue to follow God's leading, we, we can't just say, oh, well, yeah, we're, we're, we've taken a step of faith by building this building, haven't we? We, 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 we've taken a leap of faith by, by saying, hey, we're going we're gonna to do this big thing that is bigger than what we think we can do by ourselves. But will it, will it be over? Let's say we raised all the money we need to raise. Let's say we, we got all the work done that needs to get done. And, and guys, there will come a time where that building will be finished and we'll be in it and we'll be using it. Does that mean, oh, good, we've, we've arrived. Now we can all relax. No. Why? Because God's going to have the next thing for us. We need to understand that we're going to have to grow in our faith. We're going to have to develop that faith muscle as we move forward because we need to know that, we need, that God's going to continue to use us to do what comes next. That's what I want to focus on this morning. So how do we make room in our faith? Make room in our faith. It, it, I've got a couple different passages, so I'm not going to make you stand as we read each one. We're going to kind of get to them as we go. The first thing I want us to see is that we need to grow in our faith. And basically what I mean by that is growing in the things that we place our faith in. What do I mean by that? If you look at 2 Peter 3, 17 and 18, it's going to be up on the screen for you as well. It says this, so be on guard, then you will not be carried away by the errors of these wicked people and lose your own secure footing. Rather, you must grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The first way that we grow in our faith is we have to grow in our knowledge and understanding. We have to grow in our knowledge and understanding. What what I mean by that is this. When you first came to Jesus Christ, when you first came to your faith, what were you placing your faith in? You were placing your faith in Jesus as your Savior, right? When we all all first gave our lives to Christ, the the thing we were most concerned about, the thing we were probably convinced by is our eternal destination. Right? Somebody, somebody came to us and explained to us the predicament that we were in, which is when you, don't have, when you don't have Jesus, when you have a sin problem that is undealt with, what is that going to mean? That means that where do, where do sinners go that don't know Jesus? They are bound for hell. And so when you first came to faith, you placed your faith in Jesus as Savior. Someone explained to you what sin was, what the consequences of that sin was, and what the solution to that sin problem is. And they they told you about the saving grace of Jesus Christ and what he did on the cross. And you made a faith decision to say, you know what? I don't want that result. I want to end up the other way. So I'm going to place my faith in Jesus as my Savior. Is that a pretty apt description of how we came, how we came to, to Christ, right? Now, is that where it stops? Can, can you just say, okay, cool, I'm going to check that box. I've got my fire insurance covered. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to hell. Um, and now I'm just going to go back to living my life the way I want to, and, and everything's all taken care of. Is that the way, is that the way it works? Don't we, have to, don't we have to grow in our faith a little bit? Don't we have to add a few things? So, so what is it that we're doing? Well, this determines growing in our knowledge and understanding. So we learn some things about God when we start getting into his word, don't we? Now, we can learn some things about God by looking at creation, right? We can look at the world around us, and I can, I can, we can make a few decisions about some things about God. Like, we could, we could learn that God is powerful, Right? If God created this earth and the heavens and, and, and every, the galaxies that we see, doesn't that, doesn't that prove that God is a powerful God? Can, can we see that God is creative, right? We can see the, the different, you know, the, the diversity of life, the, the different species of plants and animals. I mean, all you got to do is turn on the nature channel for 10 minutes and realize, man, there's a lot of weird stuff out there, right? There, God, we can see that God is creative. Can we, can we see the, the majesty of God? I mean, my wife was born and raised in Oregon. Uh, she, the, her moving to Colorado was the first time she left Oregon. And there, there's been a couple times we've been driving around. Like we, w- we went up uh, McClure Pass and that kind of thing. And, we, you know, some of those beautiful, you know, beautiful <laughs> pictures. It was funny. We were driving along and I, and I heard my wife next to me. She goes, okay, now you're just showing off. <laughs> and she's looking out the window. You, just, you know, it was so beautiful. You know, she'd never seen the snow-capped mountains and all this other stuff. In Oregon, it's all just overcast and tall trees, <laughs> right? But, you know, so you know, we can see the majesty of God, but do we know anything about God's character? We can see even that God has a sense of humor, right? 
You know, we can see, you know, you look at the duck-billed platypus and say, okay, God definitely has a sense of humor. Here's an animal that, that lays eggs, has warm blood, um, has the, the bill of a duck, the tail of a beaver, and has venomous stingers on, their, on its back legs. It was almost as if God was like, it's as if the angels came together and said, God, we got all these leftover parts and everything. Are you done with this creation thing? He's like, he's like ah, throw it all in. Wait, let's do one more, right? Let's not have any leftovers, <laughs> right? We know, we can see those things about God, but do we know anything about God's love? Do we know anything about God's character? You see, we learn those things when we study his word. And so we need to grow in our faith. So we, we need to place our faith in God's word. Do you have the faith that it takes to believe that this word is true? Did you know that's a faith decision? Because the world will tell you that there's so much that isn't true. As a matter of fact, the world will contradict very much of what we find in Scripture. Do we have the faith to believe that this is true over what the world says? Do we, have, do we place our faith in God's character? You know, a God that cannot lie, a God that cannot, cannot do evil or, or will never do anything to tempt us to evil, that sort of thing. These are things that, that we have to choose to place our faith in. I trust God's character. I choose to trust God's promises. God makes us some promises, doesn't he? And we have to choose to place our faith in those things. When, when the world around me looks like it's falling apart, I'm, I'm, I'm putting my faith in God's promises that he's always going to be there with me, that he's always going to provide for me. You see, this, this is all about growing in our faith, is growing in the things that we put our trust in. How about God's ways? Did you know that God has has ways that are different than the world's ways? Do you place your faith in God's ways? Uh, you know, when we first come to faith, we think, oh, I need a savior. We don't realize that there's all these other things that we have to choose to trust God with. And so we have to make those choices, and we only come to that by getting to know God's word, by getting to know God's character and his promises and learning his ways. It's kind of like, kind of like a there's more divisions. I remember when we first, my wife and I, we first signed up for Comcast. We thought, hey, we want, it, we want TV because over-the-air channels were going away, right? We don't have rabbit ears anymore. Does anybody still have rabbit ears at their house <laughs> with the tinfoil? We don't, we don't get our TV that way anymore, do we? We either stream it or that kind of thing. I remember when we first went to Comcast, we were just calling them to, to get cable TV, and they started upselling me all this other stuff. They were like, oh, well, how about, how about your, your internet? You know, we can get you high-speed internet. Oh, I didn't know you guys did that. How about your, your home security? We can give you a, a home security system. And, and how about the home phone and everything? I'm like, who needs a home phone? Does, any, does anybody still use a landline anymore? <laughs> right? uh, some of these things, I didn't know they had all these other divisions. Well, sometimes when we come to faith, when we come to Jesus, we think, oh, okay, cool, fire insurance. I, this, he's going to be my savior from hell. And then you, and then you start learning, oh, did you know that God has a relationship division? Did you know that he has a, a marriage division? That he has a financial division? All these things. So we have, to, we have to learn and we have to place our faith into those other areas and say, okay, God, I'm trusting in your way over my way. And we need to grow in our faith in that way. And that, may, that, takes a, that takes a conscious choice. So we have to grow in our faith. But then, we af then after that, we have to grow our faith. What do I mean by that? Our faith is kind of like a it's kind of like a muscle, right? How do you grow a muscle? There, there are some of us that are better at it than others, right? <laughs> like, you know, whenever I go to the gym, there's always a few people that are always there. I'm like, do you guys live here? Do, do, do you have a home? Is this, <laughs> right? You know, and, and they and they have the results to prove it. I'm sitting here going, and they're like, no, but you should. I'm like, oh, shut up, right? <laughs> you know, but but how do how do we grow a muscle? Well, we we put it through something, right? We put it through something that, 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 is, that is trying to it and, and, and that we have to make a faith choice. We have to exercise that faith muscle because what happens if we don't? If we don't, we never move forward in our faith. I want, I want you to look at this next verse. This is in Hebrews chapter 5, verses 11 through 14. It says this, there is much more we would like to say about this, but it is difficult to explain especially since you are spiritually dull and don't seem to listen. I have teenagers. I feel like I've had this conversation over and over, <laughs> right? He says, you are spiritually dull and don't seem to listen. Verse 12 says, you have been believers so long now that you ought to be teaching others. 
But instead, you need someone to teach you again the basic things about God's word. You are like babies who need milk and cannot eat solid food. For someone who lives on milk is still an infant and doesn't know how to do what is right. Solid food is for those who are mature, who through training have the skill to recognize the difference between right and wrong. See, we, we must grow our faith, which means we grow our trust and our maturity by moving on from, from, the, from the, the simpler things. Now, I'll give you an example of what I'm talking about. When I taught my daughter how to drive, it was my job to teach both of my children how to drive uh, because my wife doesn't have the temperament of it, and we didn't want to try to replace any of them. We figured we'll stick with the ones we have, so I better teach them how to drive, right? The first time I taught my daughter how to drive, we, we were in the church parking lot, and we got into the car. I had her get in, and I went through the basics, and, and, and I mean starting from the basics, right? This is a brake pedal. This is your best friend, as far as I'm concerned, for the next two weeks, right? <laughs> this is your gas pedal. Never touch that one. We're not going to leave the parking lot. We're just going to idle around. You don't have to worry about that one yet, right? I'm going through the basics. This is a steering wheel. This is how you start the car. This is all this kind of stuff. And I, and I taught her the basics. And by the end of the first day, we were putting around, moving from parking space to parking space. Like I said, we never really got on the gas much. We certainly never got into second gear. Uh, we just kind of putted around. And I said, okay, uh, tomorrow we'll have another lesson and we'll pick up from there. So the next day we get in the car and I think, okay, now you remember how to start the car and all that stuff. She, and she kind of looks at me like, what? I said, well, you remember how to start the car and all that stuff. And I'm like, really? Uh, the f we had the first week, the first five lessons, we, I felt like we were starting over every time. And we never got to get to the more advanced stuff because I was always trying to reteach the same basic stuff. This is a steering wheel. This is a brake pedal. This is a gas pedal. That kind of thing. And yet sometimes we as Christians do the same thing with God, don't we? Some of us, some of us we, we have that, that saving experience. We, we have that conversion experience. We say, okay, I've trusted Jesus as my Lord and Savior, and now I'm going to go and live my life how I want to. I'm going to be one of those CEO Christians where I go to church on Christmas and Easter only, <laughs> right? Or maybe the outdoor service because that one's kind of fun, so I'll, I'll show up there and that kind of thing. I'm never going to go to Bible studies. I'm never going to read my, the Word of God. I'm just going to stay right here. Well, what happens when it, what, is, is it wrong for a baby to start out on milk? We've had a lot of babies born in our church here lately. Um, I know Andy just had a baby, and, and we've had several others that have just had babies. Is it wrong to start them off on milk? Can, can you take an infant and slide them, you know, steak and potatoes with a side of green veggies? You know, it, they're not going to be able to handle that, right? You know, they, they need something simple, something easy for their stomach to break down. I'm not saying that it's wrong that you start out on milk. But in a human baby, what's going to happen eventually? They're going to grow, aren't they? <laughs> They're going to need more than milk. Can a human baby stay on milk their whole life? No, you've got to move them to solid food. You've got to start giving them the, the stuff in the, in the jars and the cans, and then you've got to start giving them, once they develop teeth, you've got to give them stuff that they've got to chew and everything. Why? Because for their development, they, ha they can't stay on milk. And a, and a human baby is going to grow, Right? They're going to grow naturally. I mean, the growth rate of an infant is incredible. If we, if we kept an infant, I think in the first two months, the thing doubles in size, right? Goes from eight pounds when you come home from the hospital. Well, I don't know if it's a girl or a boy, but, <laughs> right? You know, I mean, when you first take, take a baby home, you're like, what is this thing? What do I do with it, right? <laughs> you know, they, they double in size. They, they're they're going to grow. But is that, does that naturally happen for us? As spiritual babies? What happens if we don't intentionally move on? We stay spiritual babies, don't we? That's what this verse says. It says here, you've been, you've been in your faith long enough. You ought to be teaching others. He says, but, but instead, we, you need someone to teach you again the basic things about God's word. You are like babies who need milk and cannot eat solid food. For someone who lives on milk is still an infant and doesn't know what is right. We have to grow our faith. Once we've learned some of the basic things, we have to continue our study. We have to continue putting it into practice in order that it continues to grow so that we can handle the more advanced things of God. 
so that we can handle the, the things that God has for us. Now, when I was teaching my daughter to drive, was it just so, was it just for my benefit? Was it just because I was tired to go, of going to the store to get milk and I wanted someone else to do the errands? That was, a, that was a nice little side benefit, right? Do you remember when your first kid started driving? You were like, you were like oh, I don't have to do that anymore. Hey, you, go get me milk. Yeah. <laughs> I want, I, I'm feeling like ice cream. Lila! <laughs> right? I love that, right? But is that the only reason I wanted her to drive? No, I wanted her to be able to drive because I wanted her to, to have the freedom to enjoy her life, the freedom to go on to what's next in life, the freedom to, to be able to do things like, like go out and get a job and go out and have friends and go out with other people and that kind of thing. I wanted, there was so much of life that they would be missing out on if they, never, if they didn't develop that skill. You see, God wants us to grow our faith because there's so much more that he wants to bless us with. There's so much more that he wants to teach us. There's so much more he wants us to experience. So how do we grow that faith? We grow that faith by putting it to the test. You see, we need to understand in order for our faith to grow, we're, we must go through some, some trying times. We must go through some, some things that will test our faith. We must go through something that forces us to make a faith choice. See, that's how we develop that muscle. That's how we develop that, that, that thing that we maybe not even know was there. Have you, ever, have you ever worked out a muscle that you didn't realize was there? We went to the gym the other day, my wife and I, we went to the gym. And normally uh, for cardio, I usually do the elliptical. Uh, I got bad knees. I've had surgically repaired knees. So I, I, don't do the, I can't do the treadmill anymore, that kind of thing. Um, obviously, I can't run. You guys saw that on Sunday night. Uh, I shouldn't run. Um, but So I, I do the, the low-impact elliptical. Well, the problem is my gym has four elliptical machines. One of them was broken. The other three were taken. Now, in my mind, I looked at I said, I said, oh, sorry, honey, they don't have room for us. Let's go home. <laughs> Right? She was like, no, no, come on, we can do, some, do something else. So we eventually, I was like, well, I don't want to do the treadmill. Um, that thing, that was, it was like a stair conveyor thing. I said, that takes an advanced degree that I don't have. And so what we had left is, is we had, there were two row machines. You guys seen those row machines? The, the seat that slides back and forth, and you, you act like you're rowing a boat, and, and you, you end up working your legs, and apparently your back and your arms and everything. We did that for 20 minutes. I woke up the next day sore in places I didn't know I had. You know what I'm talking about? Because these, these were muscles that I hadn't used in forever. And I didn't even realize, oh, I didn't even know, I didn't know that could hurt. What's, what is going on, right? And yet, in order for me to develop that, I have to be willing to go through that trying time. Guys, in order for us to develop our faith, God is going to allow us to go through things that require faith to get through. And some of us remain baby Christians because we do our best to avoid anything that looks like trials, not realizing that God is letting us go through those things so that we can develop that faith muscle. See, that's why we stay as spiritual babies, because we're never willing to do anything scary. We're never willing to try anything that might be a little bit beyond our comfort zone. We never put ourselves in a position where we have to make a faith choice. Or if we find ourselves in that position, we always take the safer option, the thing that makes sense on paper, but doesn't honor God. You know what I'm talking about? Have you been there? in your life, you need to know that those decisions are what keeps you in that spiritual infancy. And you're missing out on what God wants you to have. You need to not only grow in your faith, but you, then you need to grow your faith. You need to grow that faith. The third thing I want us to understand is that we need to take the lid off. What do I mean by that? We need to take the lid off. I mean, we need to be open to new possibilities. You see, when we make room in our faith, we need to be open to new possibilities. What does that mean? That means there's, that God is going to call us to do some things in the future that are beyond what we think we are capable of in today. You understand what I'm saying? God is going to call us to do some things that, 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 that is different than what we're doing now. Guys, if we just keep doing what we're doing now, we're going to stay where we are right now. 
right? But in order for us to, when we, let's say we get that building done and we move into that building and then it's our job to start filling that building up. What does that mean? That means some of us are going to have to step up in new ways. We're going to need new teachers. Guys, did you know that our children's ministry is still exploding? I mean, today's, today we don't have, we don't have the, the older kids over there because we, a lot of people, I think there's like 15 families that are out on vacation or camping this weekend and that kind of thing. But did you know on a regular basis we are completely filling, filling that children's building up? I mean, when we first got that building, we had adult classrooms over there, we had the offices over there, and we had a couple rooms for the kids. They have taken over. They kicked us, they kicked the adults out. We now have the adult classrooms over here. Then they kicked us out of our offices. I'm now in the trailer, and it doesn't have air conditioning. I want my office back. <laughs> right? The kids are taking over, right? What does that mean? That means we need, we need new workers. When we move into the new building, we're going, to need, we're going to need more people to step up. Did you know I truly believe there is somebody in this room, there will be somebody in this room this morning in one of the services, I believe there's at least one, possibly two or three people that are going to have to make a decision to walk away from their secular job and to take on a full-time job of ministry because I believe God grows up the, the, the leaders that we need from within our family. We're going to get to the point where we're going to need more ministerial staff. We're going to need another associate pastor. We're going to need another, another, another worker. And guys, I, I, I bet you that it's somebody that's already here right now. And yet some people are looking around like, it ain't going to be me. Tell you what, it won't be as long as you have that attitude. But it might be, <laughs> it might be if you're willing to take the lid off of what you think you're capable of. It might be. It might be that God is developing a faith within you now that is going to come into play five years from now in a way that you can't imagine. Have you guys seen that movie, Facing the Giants? It's a, it's a football movie. It's a faith-based movie. Uh, there's a clip. That I, I wasn't, I'm not going to show the clip because I don't have, really have time for that, but I'll just describe it to you. They, they have, a, they have a, a kid on the football team who's talking about how they have to play the Giants, and the Giants is the best team in the state, and, and, the, and he's like, ah, oh, we know we're, we we're going to lose. We know we're going to get beat, and the coach comes at him. He says, he says I, you know, do you really know what you're capable of? And he says, oh, I, he says, I know that there's more that you can give. Oh, coach, I'm already giving everything I've got. Prove it. He says, come and do this thing. And he, he does this bear crawl thing where they have another kid that is on his back. So he's got 160 pounds on his back. And he starts to, and he has to get down and do a bear crawl. You can't let your knees touch. You got a bear crawl. And they normally do it for 10 yards. And he says, I challenge you. I think his name is Brock or whatever. He says, I challenge you. I think you can go 20 yards. Double what they've always done before. And he says, I bet you you can do it. He says, but, he says, I want you to give me your best. No matter what, you're going to give me your best. Can you do that? And he says, okay, I will. And so what he does, the coach says, in order to ensure that, I'm going to blindfold you. He puts a blindfold over the kid. And he says, he says you're going to go as, you're going to go until you can't give me any more. He says, okay. And they start going and they, and he starts crawling and he starts going and he starts getting tired. And the coach says, no, give me your best. Don't give up. Give me your best. And he starts going with him. He starts shouting at him. He starts, he starts crawling with him saying, come on, don't give up. Don't. And he says, it hurts. I know it hurts, but you've got more. And he's doing all that stuff. And guess what happens in the end? The kid goes beyond the 20 yards. He ends up in the other end zone. He went for 100 yards. Why? Because the coach removed the kid's predetermined expectation of what he was capable of. And in the absence of having that lid on, I can go this far and no further, he was able to do way more. Now, that was a movie. That's a demonstration. I want you to know, when God looks at you, he does not look at you and see your limitations. As a matter of fact, Matthew 1720 says this, I tell you the truth, if you had faith even as small as a mustard seed, you could say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it would move. Nothing would be impossible. I'm going to say that again. Nothing would be impossible. If you would take the lid off of, of what you've decided you're capable of, if you would remove the expectation or whatever, if you, would, if you would simply say, okay, God, I am willing to be used by you in any capacity, in any way, shape, or form, do with me what you will. Did you know that if you're willing to do that, there is nothing that is impossible? 
God can do in anything he wants to through you. You say, well, I'm not gifted in that way. It's in, it's in our weakness that he is proven strong. God doesn't call the gifted. He gifts the called. Do you understand the difference? He's asking you, if he's asking you to do something, if he's asking you to step out in faith and you have your own physical limitations, well, I can't do this, I can't do that, you will always limit what God wants to do. But if you'll take the lid off, if you'll grow your faith, if you'll make room for the impossible in your life, God can do incredible things with a willing servant. Guys, God is going to call this church to do things that we can't see. I can't see the future. You know what? God doesn't reveal the whole future to us. I believe he does that on purpose. I believe God intentionally doesn't tell us all the different things that's going to happen because if we saw truly what God was going to call us to do or develop us into, we would run the other way. You know what I'm talking about? Uh, my dad will tell you the story. When he was first called to the ministry, he was very, very shy, very soft-spoken. Even to this day, he drives me crazy. I don't know how many times I've asked him to speak up on the telephone. You know what I'm talking about? He calls me on the phone. I'm like, I'm like hey, Dad, what's going on? What? I said, you know, when someone says what, it means they didn't hear you. When you repeat it, you might want to increase the volume, not just do it at the same volume. I said, Please speak. I, I, I've yelled into the, I'm, I'm driving in the truck. I'm yelling into my phone. Dad, come on, speak up. And finally he'll, he'll be like, I said, I was like, oh, I said, well, I don't want to yell. You're not, right? And yet this is the man that God called to be a preacher. He used to make the joke that his voice wouldn't carry beyond the tip of his nose. Now, as he gets older, that distance gets a little further and further. But <laughs> do you think when he first surrendered to whatever God had called in his life 44 years ago, I know it was then because I was a baby, you think that he had any idea what God was going to use him to do? Do you think that if God told him, hey, you're going to surrender to be a pastor and you're going to grow every church you've ever been in, you're going to lead every church I bring you to, to a building campaign, you're going to, you're going to, you're going to come to a church that has 30 and leave it when it has 300, he's done that over and over and over. Do you think that if God would have showed him that when he was a 22-year-old punk, that he would, have, he would have said yes, he would have run the other way? You know, every time that God has called me to something, it has scared the life out of me. When he first called me into the ministry, I said, no, thank you. I've been a preacher's kid since I was four. I see, I've seen what that life is like. I don't want it. No, thank you. I didn't make a faith choice at that point. God came back and he, you know, a calling is one of those things that's hard to ignore. You know, I, I tried to placate God. I tried to say, God, okay, God, I'll, I'll teach a Sunday school class. How about that? I'll, I'll do this. That'll make you happy, right, God? Oh, here, I'll, I'll become the children's church director, and I'll, and I'll teach children. That's kind of like being a pastor, right? That's kind of like leading. I'll do that. Here, God, here, pl be placated by this, and that didn't work. God continued to knock on my heart's door harder and harder and harder, and I got more and more and more miserable because there's nothing more miserable than a Christian that isn't following God. And I got more and more miserable until I finally made the faith choice, and I said, okay, fine. I'll be a youth and worship guy. He says, okay, that's fine. That's where your faith is right now. We'll do that. And I did that for six years. And then God said, okay, now I want to I call you to be a pastor. And I was like, no, I'm comfortable where I am. The kids think I'm cool still, <laughs> right? And I, I kind of like where, what I'm doing. And God says, no, 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 you're going to take the next step. You're going to go plant a new church from, from scratch. Oh, that scared the death out of me. Then he, said, then he said, you know what, now you're, now you're going to merge, you're, you know, you're going to take this small congregation. You know, church planting was, was interesting because there was a group of about 50 of us, and when we decided to change something, we'd be like, hey, we should change our worship service. We should make it this. So that we're, we're like, Everybody was like, cool. I was like, how about next Sunday? Cool. I mean, we could turn that thing anywhere we wanted to. That church, was we, we had all kinds of fun, and it was, it was neat. And then all of a sudden, we merged with another church, and we had hundreds of people, and we were like, hey, let's make some changes. And they were like, no. Suddenly, it was like trying to, trying to turn, became like turning a battleship. It was like, 
give us three miles in a week and we'll turn this thing around, right? And, and it, was, it was a different calling. You see, my calling has changed over the years. But it was because my faith had to be developed over those years. If God had come to me and said, listen, I want you to move to a new state and lead, lead a church through a building process and, and you're, we're going to expand and do all this, I would have been like, no thanks, I'm out. See, God doesn't give us the full picture. Do you think the disciples had any idea what their lives were going to be like in five years when they surrendered, when Jesus came to them and said, hey, you, come follow me? When they left their nets, when they left their fishing boats, do you think they had any clue what their life was going to be like in five years in the future? No. Do you think they, do you think, oh, they, oh yeah, I'm going to follow this guy, and, and we're going to go through this harrowing ordeal, and oh, and by the way, I'm going to start writing scripture. I'm going to be one of those people that writes the word of God down. Yeah, the Holy Spirit's going to work through. Do you think they had any clue? No. See, God didn't reveal to them what was going to happen because they would have run the other way, just like you and I would do the same thing. Do we have any clue what God is going to do through our church in five years from now? Do we have any clue how God wants to use this church to change this community, to change the eternity of the, of the people that, that are within driving distance? We have absolutely no idea, and yet we're following one step at a time. But I want to challenge you. I need you to understand you're going to have to make some room to grow your faith, because some of us are going to have to step up in ways we've never done it before. we got to make some room in our faith. you got to take the lid off. God has incredible things in store for us, and nothing is impossible to him. Nothing. Are you going to be a part of that? Are you going to make some room? Are you going to grow your faith? Are you going to be willing to, to take on some of that? Are you going to are you going to trust in his character and his, his ways and his promises? Are you going to go through those trials and those situations where you're forced to make a faith choice and, and put that, go through the soreness and, the, and the, the work to develop that faith? And are you going to be willing to say yes to the impossible when it comes? Would you bow with me for a word of prayer? Heavenly Father, as we're here this morning, I pray that you would help each one of us to understand that it's not just about making some changes in our lifestyle. It's not just about changing our schedules. It's not just about changing our finances or, or, or how our openness to others. Lord, it's about surrender. It's about being willing to be used by you in any way, shape, or form. God, I do not know what's in store for me. I do not know what's in store for this church two, three, five years in the future. What I do know is that you are an incredible God. What I do know is that you can do incredible things. And for whatever reason that you've chosen, you've chosen to do them through us. You've chosen to use us as your hands and your feet. You've chosen to work through your local church, the local body. You've chosen to make us the body of Christ. May we have the faith to see it happen. May we have the faith to say yes when that comes. Lord, that, that's what I pray for every person here. That you would help us develop that faith. That we would make room for what you have next for us. In your name I pray. Amen. I ask that you stand with us as we sing a song of invitation. Pastor Albert will be down here. I'll be down here. If God has spoken to your heart, if you've got questions, if you've got something you just need to pray about, we invite you to come as we sing together.
offering as we worship with this next song.
Amen. We serve a faithful God indeed. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved us. God bless y'all. Go in peace and serve the Lord.